So yes, welcome to this week's CMC Markets Charting Analysis webinar. Um, got the risk warning on the screen here. We'll just zoom through that. Any questions at any stage, um, best way to just send it through the, the chat window. You can do it to all publicly or you can just send it privately straight to me. Um, either way it works. Uh, and then I can um, address those as we're going along or, or just cover them at the end. So quite a busy week ahead of us actually, quite a few things going on. Um, we've got um, a fair bit of Chinese economic data coming out. Obviously China's been one of the, uh, the major headwinds and it's slowing economy uh, this year. Um, those concerns seem to have abated um, in the past few weeks, um, but this is quite a flush of data including the GDP report this week, so that, that could change things. Um, it's unlikely to because um, Chinese, uh, China's currency has become more stable. Obviously we have the offshore rate um, it's not as liquid, it's a bit harder to trade than some of the major currencies, um, but the, uh, the default is the, the dollar C and H pair here. And you can see that, um, you know, after depreciating rapidly, it's kind of come back in line and it's at the lowest levels this year at the moment. So it was those con currency concerns that were the biggest con concern about for markets and, and it was these, the slowing growth type dynamic that kind of exacerbated that, but not by itself. Uh, China's economy has been slowing for a while, so there's nothing new this year. It was this um, sudden ramp up um, in, in dollar CNH or, and, and dollar CNY, the onshore rate that really got people worried. <clears throat> That's pulled back largely because of dollar weakness, and, uh, and so those concerns are off the table at the moment. And that dollar weakness has helped a lot of things. Obviously, uh, oil price is still very much a factor. Um, we're, we're back up above 40 in Brent. Uh, this week, we um, a bit less in the way of central banks. We've got the Bank of England on Thursday, so um, cable looking a bit hairy today, despite um, uh, a lack of economic data really driving things. Uh, the political situation is actually playing into cable more than it normally would. Uh, when I say cable, I'm talking about the uh, British pound against the dollar, obviously. And it's the, uh, the beginning of U.S. earnings season, so um, we saw a bit of a pullback last week in U.S. stocks, probably the biggest pullback since we put in a low in February. We'll have a look at the, um, the S&P and the Dow Jones in a second or our versions of them, obviously, and um, you know, we'll see what the dynamic is there. But um, you know, the, 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 US, the U.S. market's been pretty pretty solid, given the fact their expectations have been paired right back in terms of how much uh, U.S. companies are going to earn on aggregate. So today we've got Alcoa reporting. That's a sort of unofficial kickoff of U.S. markets. Um, but earnings expect to drop about 8% year over year, um, but nonetheless, we're at multi-month highs, um, highest this year in U.S. stocks. Uh, I'll pull up the old, since I'm talking about it, I'll pull up the S&P. At the moment, um, stroll out to our weekly chart, we can see that, you know, we're still inside our range and we're at the top of the range. Um, you know, again, a lot of that because of the weakness in the dollar because of um, a bit more dovish Fed policy, only looking at probably two rate hikes this year is consensus. And, um, you know, these lower interest rates are, you know, that's basically what a lot of these market gains are built off. So, um, so that's, that's been positive for markets and obviously a weaker dollar has been positive for commodities as well and oil was the big worry at the start of the year too. So, as I mentioned in the, um, the update here, on the weekly chart we've had, it's not a, um, you know, it's kind of better when you're looking, talking about Harami patterns, it's, it's easier trade if the inside bar is small and the first bar is long. Now the first bar is quite long here, but the second bar is also pretty long. It's, it's basically kind of matched the first week, closed off the lower bit, but um, a pretty similar trading range. And so that, but nonetheless, that's a Harami pattern, basically shows that we've sort of stalled basically these two peaks from, uh, from December. 
and we're coming into the top of this trading range, which I've just kind of used these two major peaks here to find the top, and uh, you know these two, three troughs down here to determine the, the bottom of it, and we're, we're running into the top. So the closer we get into this declining trend line, and then this area up here, you know, the bigger the risk is that we eventually roll over, and that could have already begun to happen down here, but it doesn't seem to have been the catalyst yet. Um, there may be, as I said, there's quite a few things going on this uh, this week, not least of which happens on Sunday, where we've got the um, the OPEC non-OPEC producer meeting, um, talking about a possible freeze in oil production among, you know, namely with the Saudi Arabia and Russia. If that kind of fizzles out and doesn't do anything, you know, that could be uh, that could mean that there's a rollover in oil prices and and, and stocks and oil have been pretty well linked this year, and so that that could be the trigger for us rolling over here. I've got this little line here, which doesn't mean much on the, on the weekly chart, but say if we are looking for a breakdown of this inside bar, kind of inside bar, more like a Harami pattern. Harami, by the way, just looks at the, you know, the Japanese candlesticks just look at the body of the candlesticks, um, so this body fits inside this body, um, whereas the when you're looking at traditional Western bar charts, you're actually paying attention to the highs and lows, so this obviously made a higher high, so not um, not actually an inside bar. But if we drop down to the daily chart, here we can see if we if we hold this low from, from Thursday, if we hold higher today, that, that will be a swing low with two higher candles on either side. So then one trigger we can look this is this is the weekly uh, low here marked by this candlestick. So a drop through this, camp, this rising trend line and this, uh, this low here could be the sign, uh, first signs of a possible breakdown, um, which, which triggers the end of this strong uptrend that we've been in since, since February. The, the, uh, the Dow Jones looks pretty similar. Uh, the equivalent trend line has arguably, be, arguably been broken. Although you can kind of mess it around a bit and um, change it here, and it's, it's less broken. But um, here's the top of the trading range again, and here's the here's the peak up here, which we haven't quite got to. So here's an equivalent sort of trend line here. So it's just if we're looking for the market to break down, you know, what's going to tell us it's happening? You can see this trend line holding up quite well. You know, it'd look even, you know, if we go down, drop down to an hourly chart, you know, it'll be a lot, uh, be a lot more clear cut. So we're he heading into a big long-term resistance area, and we've got a trend line supporting us. If we break down below it, of course, it could be a false break and, you know, you get knocked out of the trade, but um, pretty favorable risk to reward if we do reverse this long trend that we've had because, um, you know, we've come pretty much straight up. So you'd imagine, you know, in the case of the US 30 here, this was support, didn't act as much resistance, but a little bit. We've got a bit of a pullback here, then broke the 200-day moving average and went up right up to the trend line. So you can imagine we might actually get back down to this 200-day moving average and this um, this old support and resistance and support again, a uh, bit of a pivot around um, basically around the sort of 17,000 mark ish. <laughs> So uh, something to look out for there, but obviously for the moment, you know, we're just looking at hypotheticals here. The, the trend is is still higher, but um, you can see here we've got a bit of a double top in the RSI. Momentum's already rolled over, um, so potentially, depending on how these different events take place this week, we you know we could be looking at um, a little interim top in the market. Let's switch over to, to UK stocks this week. Um, uh, sorry, it's next. Um, been an incredibly tight range in the, in the FTSE 100. Basically between the sort of 60, 70 and sort of 6, 200 to 210. It's pretty well defined the market. You know, you, you know it's plain as day to see. Um, it's this tight range here. As of today, we just hit that 200-day moving average, which could be a trigger for a few people to sell. Um, to me, the, the bias here is probably the fact that we haven't been able to 
to push sustainably above the 200-day um, suggests to me that this seems to me more likely to resolve to the downside, but maybe not, you know, not right down to retesting the lows, maybe just down to sort of 5,900, maybe retesting this broken declining trend line here, which looks a bit better on this. Um, I say it doesn't actually look better there, but you can see uh, it's basically these peaks through here that I'm going to add. I think I've lost it a bit there. Like, Using using these peaks here, you can see a false break, false break, but then works again, works again. So maybe a, a retest of this line to then push higher. At the end of the day, it's um, we're not in a we're not in a very trendy environment in in stocks at the moment. So if you're you know if you've caught a breakout trade and you're sort of riding the the trend higher, obviously wouldn't be the case in the FTSE at the moment. I think you've got to just be aware of the fact that it it it's not likely to run that far um, you know it's fair you know since we bottomed in August you can pretty much say that we've been in a choppy trading range with no real nicely defined trends this was a the best we got in terms of a downtrend but it was incredibly choppy incredibly wavy um, took a long time you know if we if you'd sold the breakdown here it would take a hell of a long time just to get you down here <clears throat> Uh, European stocks looking distinctly uh, distinctly weaker, particularly than those in the U.S. Just looking at the uh, the Germany 30. Here um, you'll see that you know it's a bit of a kind of use of um, uh, uh, you almost say you know matching the indicator to where the price is reversed here. But you will find that sometimes when you put in a low and then you you push higher, then you try and get through that low again. You know that's basically a false breakdown there. So actually the true low is this original one. Um, so then if you take that up to a similar thing at the top, if you use that as the peak, and then this was really just a false break at the top of the top, and then we got, we got kind of a triple top in the end and rolled over, then you, we find ourselves down at this 50% retracement mark here, um, and just above the previous swing low for March. So it basically failed to break above this um, six, uh, six, uh, sorry, nine, 900 level, several failed attempts and we eventually rolled over, which is what I sort of suspect might happen in the, um, the 5100 where we basically haven't been able to break higher and you resolve down and then you push up a bit. Not a massive amount in terms of uh, notable uh, UK earnings, except uh, probably the front and centre would be just on Wednesday. We've got results from, from Tesco's and a couple of other retailers scattered around on Wednesday and I think Thursday too, uh, Debenhams also reporting. But just like today, it's going to be the miners that really kind of dictate the state of play. That obviously rests a lot on the uh, oil and metals prices, and also the banks. Uh, banks are doing well today, but they had a bit of a rough week last week, um, kind of following suit with what's happening in Europe. Um, the fact that the ECB in their minutes seem to sort of apply that, um, you know, more rate cuts into the negative was was a possibility if, if inflation doesn't pick up. And so that, that's um, that's a worry for, um, for, for banking profits because, you know, you, they just can't, you know, they, they, you know, obviously, if interest rates are ten uh, percent, um, and uh, you know they're charging us ten percent, and they're paying five percent, they're making five percent. If interest rates are, you know, half a percent, and they're charging us, um, you know, one percent, that half percent is not as good as that five percent. In very simplistic terms, it's just not a great time for banks, and negative interest rates makes it even harder. They're being charged while they're actually not charging us for the time being, at least on our deposits. Obviously, the big one uh, last week, if we switch over to currencies, was the yen. Uh, I hope some of you are in this dollar yen trade because we've been pointing out for a while um, in my last week's snapshot video, I pointed back to our video from a month prior, which talked, uh, you know, when we were up at about 117.50, um, talking about a, uh, you know, 116 being the big level and then down from there a possibility of 105. And so, you know, we're from 117.50, we're, we're, we're down one big handle from there. We're down, we're, we're at 108 now. So let's have a look at that chart of dollar yen. 
you know, at the end of the day, we, you know, if you're not on board yet, there's probably some more room to go on this. But um, realistically, when you decline eight of the last nine days and you take out 900 to 1,000 pips, uh, obviously we saw worse here. So, you know, if you take this as a kind of um, bare flag, with the pole, the flag, and another pole, then, you know, we've got a bit more room, probably down to about 106. Um, but uh, still, the, the trade is a bit old at this point. So I would say that maybe just this um, this quite strong reversal that we had on uh, on Friday suggests that there's still a fair bit of selling momentum. We haven't quite followed through on it today, though, obviously, uh, putting in a kind of little minor double bottom on the short-term short -term charts. So this is the weekly chart that we've been referring to for a while with 116, the big breakdown level, basically a head and shoulders pattern with a nicely um, retested broken trend, uh, trend line. And uh, obviously, if you sold at the broken trend line, I mean, that's just textbook. And if you held it down to here, and even if you hold it down to the 105, you know, that's down to this support. That's That literally is a textbook trade. I think if we uh, I think if we can close the week back of 110, and then um, you know also to some extent just uh, 111, which had been holding up the price in that consolidation that we were looking at on the daily chart, then you know then you probably don't want to be as um, aggressively short. But for the time being, the trend is is well down, has a little bit further to go, but um, you're going to have to be careful because there's going to be some short covering rallies. The big fundamental point is. Uh, Will and and if so, when will the Bank of Japan intervene directly in the currency market and actually start selling yen, buying dollars, and, and pushing this currency pair higher? My sense is that um, they'd be unwise to do so at this point. I mentioned this in the in the morning comment, um, which I'll be doing this week um, instead of Michael Houston. Uh, that. Um, so I, I tend to think that um, they're, they're, the Bank of Japan are comfortable with the, they've mentioned specifically they're comfortable with the exchange rate above 100. And I think with this kind of um, momentum against them at this point, they, you know, they, they would risk losing face if they intervened and it failed. So they have a bigger chance of success if, you know, for example, not so much you and I, but um, big traders jump on board short this dollar yen pair around here. So if they're short down at 108, and then we get down to, to 10, below 105, and then there's a big squeeze 300 pips higher, you know, there's suddenly those people short at 108, they're offside. Uh, the people at 116, short from 116, they're still sitting pr pretty at this point. And if we have the short squeeze from here, from 116, even took us back up to 113, those people who are short at 116, they're not going to, you know, they're not going to be flooding out of the market. Um, they're, they're, they're able to hold on. They're sitting strong at a higher position. So you need, uh, from the Bank of Japan's kind of sort of trading dynamic perspective, if, it, if, that, <laughs> if that's a word, uh, if that's a sentence, is uh, to wait for a, a bigger drop, um, so you're able to squeeze those weaker hands uh, when you do intervene. And, uh, you know, you need the price to drop further, more people to get in short at lower prices to be able to squeeze those extra people and really create a big price move and scare everyone else out of the market as well. I don't think that would work at this point, but, um, you know, we'll see what happens. Um, it could happen this week if we, I mentioned the note, if we've got a, uh, in the first few days of this week, it's not really happened today, but maybe tomorrow, Wednesday, if we get a big push down below 105, then then they may be tempted to get drawn in just because of the speed of the descent. Um, you know, the, the British pound has been the other big loser. Um, so Euro sterling being the big gainer, it's, it's dropping off quite hard today. If you'd been following my chart forum posts or my Twitter posts, um, you saw that I've been mentioning this level, and it's actually working out a treat at the moment. Uh, and, you, and you can kind of see why. So <clears throat> here, was the, here was the low back in July of 2010, and then that corresponded nicely with the top of this consolidation here in uh, September 2014. And we, we came up to that level, and we have that kind of pivot point. And we also have the 61.8% the retracement of this entire decline in that same area. And there's also the, um, 
Uh, it's also not far above 80, the round number. Uh, so we'll push them right into 80 now, but this was around 81. Um, just above there um, is, uh, is this particular pivot level, uh, so 8150. I believe there's, if you connect, I, I don't like it because I feel like the trend's already accelerated away from here, but there's a trend line down through these highs as well. Was it these two maybe that, um, that also point to a resistance around this sort of 8150? We've not got there. This uh, 61.8 has worked pretty nicely for the time being. Um, we may still get to the 81.50 for maybe the final top um, if these people get in short now, uh, get squeezed out the market with another little push higher. But um, here you can see quite a big drop down in Euro pound today. And uh, it's mostly sterling strength. You can see the same thing happening in pound dollar. Um, Maybe just as there was a bit of political risk last week, Cameron was in a fair bit of trouble. Looks like he's going to get through the storm as of this week, um, introducing some new plans to crack down on uh, wealth, the wealthy using tax havens. Um, he might have a bit of a rough ride in this Wednesday's parliamentary questions, but uh, looks like he's going to be okay and probably won't dent the Brexit, uh, the sort of Remain campaign too badly. And you know, and the only reason I mention that is because politics only really mention, only really matters uh, when it's you know when it's felt that it could impact whether Britain stays in the eurozone <coughs> in Europe, so in the European Union. So um, yeah, this is I mean this is a good trend, and uh, if I just shift this little line up here, this is some fairly clear cut resistance down at. Um, 7930ish so look for a pullback into the area and you know and, and if we do have some sort of uh, reversal candlestick in that vicinity depending on your trading strategy whether you're waiting for a reversal candlestick or a shorter term time momentum change or whatever the case may be that to be could be the the area to get involved um, you know if we if we get right down to 7840 again near these lows in um, uh, at the end of March my feeling is that probably that's um, that's this rise done for the time being, and we move back into a more sort of sideways choppy market. But as mentioned, uh, Sterling, one of the big movers today, up 120 pips, um, and uh, and that's just this support level working fairly well. Um, you know, depending on the tightness of your stop, this is an example where okay, you know, you bought at two previous obvious supports. If you had your stop under 140, which is the sort of round number support, um, even better if you'd bought down at just pure the round number, wouldn't have been such a solid case for doing so. You can see this rising RSA trend line, backed up by that pretty obvious horizontal support, has worked out nicely. Um, so if you had had your stop down here, you know you'd be well into two times risk on your reward um, back up here. And this line that I've got just pertains back to a super long-term support over there. Mm. But, you know, we're range-bound at the moment. I think there's there's probably a good chance we push up to 144 again. Uh, but obviously today has been a big move higher. Um, but I suspect it does does continue up to 140, just because that's the nature of the, the, the trend at the moment. Um, you don't – it's just a less it, – it could – of course it can always happen, but there's just less chance – of a sort of pullback trade working, we, you know, we're here, we've pulled down, and then maybe we're back about 50% at this point. So here we are perfectly at 50, pretty much. Um, let's drop the time down, down a bit. To my, in my experience, we may get a bit of a drop from this area because it's half of that decline. But what, what's the context? That decline is just within a trading range. So that's the bottom of the range. This is the top of the range up here near 144, 50, 145. So why would you sell the retra – we're not in a downtrend where you're selling a 50% retracement, um, expecting the downtrend to continue. Um, of course it could, but you know, it's much more likely we just push to the top of the range again. So a low probability trade in my mind. Um, I'll try and remember saying that for next week's webinar and see if that proved true or not. 
So I'm mumbling on a bit this webinar, so um, coming to the end of it, um, we're just going to cover some commodities. If there were any kind of questions, um, then uh, feel free to let me know. And uh, I can always extend the, the length of the webinar a bit. Um, crude not doing much today, but um, you know we basically came off today's highs because you can see uh, a fairly clear cut. The August lows have worked as support three times. They've worked as resistance once, and they appear to be working again. And <clears throat> to my mind, not much likelihood of pushing much beyond 42 this week ahead of those Doha meetings on Sunday unless um, unless something gets leaked, unless some sort of freeze is pre-announced, which is possible. Um, but I suspect probably this week we're just going to get a mild drop back in oil prices down to around the sort of 40 level on Brent because there's not really much else to drive it. Um, even if we got another big draw in weekly inventories from the U.S., still how aggressively long would you realistically want to be uh, before you know the result of those those mo meetings between um, Saudi Arabia and, and, and Russia? Because that, that's a game changer. Um, you know, if anything, you know, you basically use a bit of uh, chart positioning to to to. Um, take an uneducated guess on what they actually end up doing in that meeting. Um, you know, you could go short right in this kind of vicinity just with the hope that they don't agree on anything and, and oil prices drop again on the idea of um, oversupply. Um, or you could wait for a pullback back down to maybe 38 or so if we can, if we can get that low this week. Uh, on the hope that actually they do agree something, and so you're, you're selling selling resistance or buying a support um, before a fundamental event that maybe works out your way, or maybe it doesn't. But if to, to be buying up here, you're obviously buying right before major resistance, which is generally not a great idea. Mm -hmm. uh, we, yeah, we, we didn't have too much time, but I did want to kind of touch on silver and copper, which I don't normally do so. Um, gold is up big today. Let's just quickly look at it. It's basically running right into um, 12, 1250 at the moment, um, finding some resistance from 1250. We had a big reversal from 1250 on the 24th of Feb. Seems to be kind of in that reversing from that same area at the moment, struggling to get through it. Above that, we've got this quite big reversal from 11th of Feb. That 11th of Feb top in gold wasn't quite the top. We had a few false breaks above it. That matches the bottom in most global equities. Um, so gold trying to push below, uh, push part beyond that sort of risk-off peak, um, which which goes a bit counter to most of equity, most of the equity markets being well away from it, uh, uh, their their respective equivalent lows. <clears throat> so. Either if we peak here or if we do manage to push up to 1260, still a bit of a risk of a very choppy looking head and shoulders pattern that could um, eventually break with about 1200 ish being the, um, you know, or maybe 1210 being the neckline. A bit choppy really to really call that at this point. Um, silver was a bit more interesting. Just because, uh, you know, I've scrolled out my, my daily chart a fair bit here because we had this. Trend line where we got we had a false break, went all the way down, basically successfully tested, um, successfully tested the 200-day moving average, got a false break through it, held it, didn't go as low as the previous low down here, and we've pushed right back up to the trend line again. So don't get too distracted by the trend line, but you know the fact that we. The trend line seems to be working where it's pausing where we are at the moment. The 200-day moving average as well, and that holding above that previous low, bit of evidence to suggest some some underlying strength in, in silver. But still, you know, the caveat is that we're in a, basically in a range-bound market with about 1480. I would say that that low that we just put in is the bottom of the range, and and this 1595 to 16 being the top of the range. So really, to be very confident that it's breaking out to a an uptrend. You want a, you don't want you want a nice solid close above 16, but obviously that's a lot later in the game than we are at the moment 
you know, this would be a much better entry price down here if we can get a close above the trend line. It's just not as um, certain of a directional move. Equally in copper, we also had a kind of down sloping trend line, which was pretty, pretty well defined. And we've dropped right down to retest it here. And it's also the 61.8% retracement of that of that pickup of the lows. So not a huge reaction on the first test, doesn't bode well. But nonetheless, we've got these lows down here, so maybe a confluence of Fibonacci, previous lows, and broken trend line support could be enough um, to um, uh, to trigger a, a rebound in the, in the price of copper. Maybe you keep an eye on the RSI, we're pretty oversold. If we can come out of the sold territory, maybe a bit of confirmation of those um, technical support levels. Okay, that's it for this week's uh, analysis, uh, this week's webinar. Uh, much appreciated for signing in. I hope for that was uh, I hope that was helpful. And um, good luck with trading this week, and uh, see you the same time next week. Thanks very much. Jasper Laura signing out.